I think it is absolutely wonderful that we can get almost 1,000 people at Boston University to come out for something of substance. So congratulate yourselves for doing that. Uh, let me give a welcome not only to our students who are primarily here today, but to our guests who join us from other schools, colleges, and universities, and for those of you who will join us on the web. I'm the dean of students here at the university, and let me say this. I think we need a conversation, and my job today is a simple one. I will try and make sure that we let you talk. I will hope that you will, and I will ask you to express yourself in a civil manner throughout this. Uh, please do not take any offense if I ask you to chill a little bit. And we should probably do our best to try and make sure that we uh, give all of you who want a chance to make a brief comment or, a, or to ask a question to be able to do that. We do have internal media here, and when I say internal media, we do have students who are working on various projects who will be filming and may indeed ask you questions. We also have internal media as it relates to WBUR and also uh, Boston Media, uh, Boston University Media that is here, and we also have the Daily Free Press. Let me also offer one quick bit of unsolicited advice. I hope today and tonight we'll be able to not only talk to one another, but also to listen and find those points of understanding on those points that we disagree on uh, even better. I hope that we can walk out of here and do something about a very real set of issues that are in front of us. Without further ado, what I want to do is to give you a sense of the format and then turn it over to our first uh, speaker. You will hear momentarily, momentarily from David Campbell, the provost of the university. Immediately following that, he will introduce Bilal Bilici, the uh, president of the International Students Consortium. From there, uh, Bilal will introduce our two commentators for this evening. We'll hear remarks from each one of them, and then we will open it up for people to ask questions. You see that there is one mic and only one mic. At the point where I tell you to do so, we will allow folks to get in line and to ask questions, and uh, that is what we will do. We will let you ask questions, and we will talk for the rest of the evening. Immediately following the program, there will be an opportunity for folks to stay here, to stay gathered here, and to uh, continue the discussion. Without further ado, let me ask Provost Campbell uh, to come on up. Provost David Campbell, welcome. Thank you, Dean Elmore. Uh, good evening. As Ken said, I am David Campbell, the Boston University Provost, and I am here to welcome you to tonight's event, a video conference entitled Ask Iran. It is in part an ambassadorial evening, as our two lead discussants, Ambassador Javad Zarif, the permanent representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran to the United Nations, and Boston University Professor Charles Dunbar, former U.S. Ambassador to Qatar and Yemen, will speak first and then engage each other and you, the audience, on timely issues related to Iran and the Middle East. But it is also a student and Boston University community evening, as it offers our students, faculty, and guests a chance to ask the hard questions directly and to hear the answers firsthand. We are also joined on the podium, as you know, by Dean Elmore, who will serve as moderator for the evening. This evening's dialogue is organized and presented by the Boston University International Students Consortium, a student-run organization that strives to uni unite the very diverse Boston University community by sponsoring intellectual, cultural, and humanitarian events. In October 2006, the International Students Consortium, along with the Howard Thurman Center, organized the first multi-faith dinner, celebrating simultaneously Yom Kippur, Tusera, Ramadan, and Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. It was a moment in time where unity and <coughs> common ground were truly the focus. That unity was also evident last April at a concert, again organized by the International Students Consortium, which successfully raised money for the earthquake victims in Pakistan. Tonight's event has, frankly, a somewhat different character, and as all of us must recognize, raises many questions and has generated controversy. In this context, I would like to remind us all of two important truths. First, tonight's event is about free speech, both for the presenters and for the questioners. As the great British statesman Winston Churchill remarked, the United States is a land of free speech. Nowhere is speech freer. I am pleased that Boston University is fulfilling our obligation to uphold this proud tradition. Second, history teaches us that all too often, nations that will not engage each other at the tables of diplomacy 
end up engaging each other on the fields of battle. The recent report of the Iraq study group recognized these, this truth and recommended that our government engage Iran and Syria directly on issues relating to the Middle East. I believe tonight's event is very much in the spirit of this recommendation. With that short preamble, I would like to introduce the president of the International Students Consortium, Mr. Bilal Balici, to make a few remarks. Bilal. I would like to welcome uh, everyone to the Ask Iran program. As you know, my name is Bilal Bilici. I am the president of the International Students Consortium. I'm a senior this year graduating with a bachelor's degree in economics from the College of Arts and Sciences. The International Students Consortium strives in our mission to bring together the diverse student body that we are so fortunate to have at Boston University. We have accomplished our mission by organizing events such as our um, annual cruise, um, the multi-faith dinner that we hosted uh, in October uh, for the celebration of Duzera, uh, Ramadan, Yom Kippur and Gandhi's birthday, and also Central Asia uh, Forum as well. And now, through a program of discovery with a country that's much in the news today, Iran. Please allow me to introduce the commentator for this program, Ambassador Charles Dunbar, who has been a professor of international relations department at Boston University since 2004. Ambassador Dunbar served in the uh, United States Department of State from 1962 to 1993. He served as the ambassador of Qatar from 1983 to 1985 and ambassador to Yemen from 1988 to 1991. These are just to, uh, a few of his many responsibilities during his time in the State Department and in the United Nations. Ambassador Dunbar specializes in Afghanistan, Middle Eastern politics, US foreign policy, Muslim and the Western relations, non-West Africa, Arabian Peninsula, as well as United Nations peacekeeping. We thank Ambassador Dunbar for his enthusiasm and willingness to serve as the commentator for this program. The, the moderator for this program is Boston University's Dean of Students, Kenneth Elmore. Dean Elmore has been a source of support for our organization, the International Students Consortium. Under his leadership, the Boston University has achieved and enhanced the academic, social, intellectual, cultural, and ethical growth of Boston University students. The initiatives of Dean Elmore allowed us to make more challenging programs, more controversial programs, and more intellectual programs like this evening's program. This event is a unique opportunity to explore communications between the students from Boston University and the government of Iran to ask questions about the important issue, issues facing our countries and the world today. In a time when diplomacy and discourse seem to have taken a back seat to conflict and hostility, we hope that today, above else, reason will take the precedence Ultimately, the purpose of this program and event is to emphasize the importance of the dialogue. Whether you agree or disagree with someone, it is still important to talk, as has recently been recommended by the Iraq study group. A dialogue between cultures, a dialogue between civilizations, and most importantly, between all nation states is an essential building block for peace. <laughs> News and information comes to us through various media sources like Boston Globe, New York Times, CNN, BBC World, Fox News. Tonight is our chance to directly question a representative of Iran without the filter of the news media. This is the primary source 
material, not the secondary source of material we are accustomed to receiving. The relationship between the United States and Iran has been strained since Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution, when all official diplomatic ties were uh, severed. In my opinion, efforts over the last 25 years for two sides to sit down, discuss their differences, and try to find a common ground have been very few. Both sides, at different times, have pursued engagement, but unfortunately, for political or ideological reasons, these opportunities have been lost. Today, the United States and Iran find themselves in a really difficult position and really dangerous situation. Ambassador Zarif is one of the most qualified diplomats to provide Iran's perspective on these controversial matters, and also to report back to Iran what he learns from us this evening. Ambassador Zarif, Iran's current ambassador to the United Nations, has been Iran's main window to the United States since 2002. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in international relations from San Francisco State University, and a master and a doctorate in international law and politics from the University of Denver. Since earning his doctorate from the University of Denver, Ambassador Zarif has spent last 19 years as a career diplomat in the service of government of Iran. He served 10 of these years as Iran's deputy minister, foreign minister, since his mission to the United Nations in 2002, Ambassador Zarif has earned a reputation as one of New York's most talented, most prestigious, and most effective diplomats. Moreover, the Ambassador Zarif is accessible not only to the diplomatic community, but to student organizations like ours. He has spoken at other universities such as Fairleigh Dickinson, Princeton, and Columbia. We are very fortunate that he has agreed to participate in the live video conference with us today. Ambassador Zarif is unable to travel outside radius of 25 miles of New York as he is restricted by the US Department of State. After a brief introductory statement, Ambassador Zarif will be open to questions. First, from our commentator and mo uh, moderator, and then from the audience. Ambassador Zarif, good evening. Good evening, Bela. Now, please allow me to open the floor to our guest, Ambassador Zarif. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bilal, for that gracious introduction. Let me, first of all, thank Boston University for having organized this event. Uh, I'm grateful to Dean Elmore, Provost Campbell, uh, Mr. Beligi, Ambassador Dunbar, and one of your students, friends who, are, who is here with me, Jessica Stowalski, uh, who has taken the trouble of organizing this event. And let me greet all of you, whichever way you are facing and whatever T-shirt you're wearing, uh, and hope that and hope that we can engage in a uh, sincere dialogue. I cannot agree more with Dean Elmore and Provost Campbell and Bilal that dialogue is an essential requirement of our days. Several years ago, our former president, Khatami, proposed to the United Nations that we should engage in dialogue among civilizations as the most proper way of addressing our differences. Dialogue seems to be easy because we all believe that we engage in dialogue. But dialogue requires, first and foremost, a readiness to listen and a readiness to examine one's assumptions and be prepared to be convinced 
We all engage in discussion, and as has been said by many, uh, talking is certainly better than fighting. But here at the UN, and I've been in this job, uh, in this business, doing work at the UN for most of my adult life, basically since 1982 on and off, we do seem to be talking to each other, but we're not listening to each other. And I hope that I can listen to you uh, as much as I want you to listen to my brief uh, introductory remarks. And I, have, I do not have any prepared uh, remarks, so I'll just try to uh, share with you some thoughts and then probably use most of the evening tonight to listen to you and see if, with regard to some of your questions or concerns or comments, uh, to learn from you and to see if I could make some clarifications. And I'm looking forward to a good discussion with Ambassador Dunbar and, and the rest of you. Now, dialogue is a requirement, particularly in difficult times. You need to engage in dialogue in order to remove misperceptions. But dialogue, as I said, has a prerequisite. You need to engage in a dialogue in order to find solutions. But you need to be looking for solutions. Unless you're looking for solutions, you cannot find them. If the policy of one or another country is to seek a confrontation, if the motivation, the interests are directing us to look for or sometimes even create facts in order to provoke a conflict and a confrontation, then one can wonder what would be the usefulness and utility of dialogue. But nevertheless, I am grateful for this opportunity that has been provided to me to engage in dialogue with a group of very bright students at Boston University, and I'm looking forward to, to this discussion. The problems in our region are immense. Unfortunately, we are right in the middle of a crisis of very serious proportions. If you look at the statistics, about 100 people have been killed every day over the last three years. That has been a steady figure that has been shown, sort of 36,000 uh, every year. That's a huge figure of, of innocent civilians who are being killed in Iraq. Unfortunately, we are seeing that a war that some people called a war of choice against Iraq has created a breeding ground for extremists and for terrorists in a region that was already volatile. Now, don't get me wrong. Nobody in Iran has lost any sleep over the removal of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was a dangerous dictator who attacked Iran, who used chemical weapons against Iran, who created a nightmare for Iranian people for over eight years. Unfortunately, during those eight years, Saddam Hussein enjoyed the support, acquiescence, and, and sometimes very active backing of the majority of the international community, be it so, then Soviet Union, and unfortunately, the United States and the Western world, who turned a blind eye even to the use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein. So in Iran, we were happy to see that the region and the Iraqi people were relieved of the presence of a dictator. But we also knew that the way the United States chose to implement this policy was an important and dangerous uh, created a very dangerous situation that would lead to the rise in extremism. Many of us coming from the region, because 
those who are coming from the region know this region best. And most of us, uh, the diplomats who came from the Middle East, stated very clearly before the war started, the war in Iraq started, that this war can only lead to greater extremism in the region. I remember myself saying that in front of the Security Council just about a week or so before the invasion of Iraq. Unfortunately, that has taken place. It's a mess. Nobody alone can take care of this mess. The United States alone, nor the countries in the region alone, can bring stability to Iraq. It requires a collective effort in order to find a solution to the Iraqi problem. We in Iran certainly have every interest to see stability in Iraq. A turmoil and instability in Iraq has direct consequences for Iranian security. We will be, unlike the United States, what the United States can do, in fact, if the situation gets out of hand, is that the United States can simply pack up and leave. But my country, your country, Bilal, other countries in the region, we cannot pack up and leave. We're there. We're stuck. We need to find a reasonable solution to the problem in Iraq. We have a high national security interest in bringing stability to Iraq. And that, I believe, is a common ground for all those who want to seek stability in Iraq in order to put their forces together, their efforts together, in order to achieve that. And Iran has always been ready for that. We have called for countries in the region. Iran was the initiator of uh, cooperation among countries in the region. We have called for international efforts in order to bring stability and security to, to Iraq. We have established excellent relations with various Iraqi governments after the fall of Saddam Hussein. We're the first ones to recognize the governing council, and since then have been in uh, cooperating with the government of Iraq. Unfortunately, in spite of the recommendations of the Baker Hamilton uh, Iraq study group, the United States decided to pursue a different line. And <clears throat> over the past several weeks, we have been seeing an attempt to create facts in order to support that policy. But what needs to be said, and I'm prepared to uh, entertain questions and comments on this uh, uh, when we start our dialogue, what needs to be, what, the question that needs to be asked is whether our region can tolerate, in fact, another crisis, whether this region can, in fact, go through another crisis instead of resolving this one, and whether accusations against Iran in the region, attempts uh, to create division within the Iraqi population, to revive some old policies. I do not want to bore you with history, but right after the revolution in Iran, there was an attempt, unfortunately, a policy by the United States to support Sunni extremism in the region, partly due to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and partly as an attempt to contain the Iranian revolution. We should not see a revival of that, because we already saw what was the implications of that policy. Al-Qaeda, September 11th, all of them were the results, unintended results, of a policy of trying to use one side against another, to contain one group with another, to force policies of exclusion and alliance formation against one or another country. I believe the essence of a new paradigm, moving away from a paradigm that was based on perception of an enemy as a tool for global interactions to a paradigm that requires cooperation between various countries and various actors in international relations, which is essential in today's world. In order to move from that paradigm to a new paradigm, we need to set aside the policies that have brought so much misery to our region, have brought so much injustice and war and turmoil to our region, and instead of those policies, 
pursue a policy of inclusion, see how best we can bring every actor with various interests in this Persian Gulf area together in order to ensure security. This region has seen three wars in the space of three decades. And I think three wars is already enough. Now, I think if we, if we look at the other issues, uh, particularly the Iranian nuclear situation, we also see a similar tendency, whether we are looking for solutions or whether we are trying to build a crisis. Let me leave it at that. I'm sure some of you have questions on any of these issues or issues that I did not touch because I did not want to bore you with, with a long introductory comment. But, but the point that I want to uh, stress and I think would be useful for us to discuss is whether there are solutions and whether we should look for solutions or whether we should look for trouble and turmoil and confrontation in the region. I think rationality and human interest would dictate that we look for solutions rather than confrontation. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Professor Dunbar. Ambassador Zarif, uh, Dr. Campbell, Dean Elmore, and Mr. Baligi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of introductory comments, and I had I'm going to make no bones about the fact that I have some things to say and um, that uh, I hope will be in the same cooperative spirit that Ambassador Zarif has mentioned. Uh, I want to do the, get the, the very serious part over first. I, until I saw him this evening, I had only understood that uh, Rabbi Heller had offered me his apology uh, for describing me in an email he sent earlier today as little more than a glorified moderator. <clears throat> That's in quotes. For three reasons, I believe he uh, did not need to extend that apology. First and foremost, I suppose I've been called much worse and that I can live with, uh, with that term generally. Secondly, um, glorified is not so bad. <laughs> and then finally, thirdly, uh, by training and by strong personal inclination. Uh, I am a moderate person. It is something that I would be very happy to have graven on my tombstone. And if I can introduce some moderation into these proceedings, I will feel that I've uh, had a, a measure of success. Um, that point aside, I want to note uh, that Iran is a very special country. Uh, for my family and me. My wife, our nine-month-old daughter, and I arrived in Tehran in the spring of 1963 uh, on my first diplomatic assignment and spent uh, the next four years there and in Esfahan, where our younger son was born in 1964. During those years, I was in extensive and intense contact with a broad uh, cross-section of Iranian society, including government officials, security service officers, business and professional people, farmers, pastoralists, workers and shopkeepers, as well as journalists, religious figures, and uh, teachers and students. I spoke Farsi from morning till night for those four years. Uh, and. Uh, was never so familiar with my surroundings uh, in any of the subsequent seven diplomatic assignments I had for the United States, and certainly in one assignment that I had for the United Nations. Um, I thus owe a great debt of gratitude to a great civilization, to a fascinating 21st century country, and to a host of bright, charming and hospital, hospitable Iranians who made those four years an unforgettable period in my life. So that's the um, unpaid uh, personal statement. And I'd now, now like to go on to say that I really have two purposes here this evening. I, I wrote these notes, as you probably guessed, before coming here. Uh,
The first is to offer some thoughts of my own about the U.S.-Iranian relationship, and the second is to comment on what Ambassador Zarif has said. I want to say that Ambassador Zarif, for the most part, has stayed on a level of, of generality uh, that uh, provoke few comments on my part. I have uh, one or two questions which I will get posed, uh, I think, and if I don't, I, I do not think it'll be the, the end of the world. But I would like to simply echo a point that he's made, perhaps in a little bit more uh, graphic language. I think our two countries now are lurching in the direction of a confrontation uh, that could end in uh, a situation which both of us would regret enormously having created. Uh, I remind you that the break in diplomatic relations between the United States and Iran has been now 26 years. Uh, I also remind you that our break in relations with uh, the Soviet Union, a country which, um, uh, as I recall, was one with which we did not enjoy uh, a particularly warm and fuzzy relationship, was 16 years. And furthermore, it is, I have to say that at the present time, the prospect for a restoration of formal diplomatic relations is dim. I think the lack of these formal contacts, uh, contacts benefits neither country, and uh, as I will do many times tonight, I echo the, the spirit of the Baker-Hamilton report in calling for such contacts. I think other things that are going on in the relationship at the present time is that uh, the United States, of course, has maintained tight economic sanctions on Iran, and the United Nations Security Council is prepared to, um, uh, to implement further measures of that kind. We have sent uh, a second carrier battle group uh, for deployment in the Persian Gulf. Uh, the U.S. government has asserted, as a matter of certainty, uh, that the Iranian government is arming those opposed to us in Iraq uh, and therefore has, for a substantial period of time, been arresting Iranian officials uh, working in the country, detaining them for the most part for a few days and um, then releasing them. But uh, last Friday, the United States government revealed via the Washington Post that it had for some time uh, given our forces the order to shoot and kill Iranians if we believed they were, um, they were uh, a threat to the security of, of our troops. All this comes against the backdrop of old, I stress old, in, uh, American investigative reporting that uh, U.S. Uh, clandestine operatives uh, have been inside Iran uh, looking into how we might possibly conduct a military operation there should it um, should that be deemed necessary. Now what I want to say next is what I see as the elements in Iranian policy and United States policy that are creating this uh, dangerous situation. I identified three uh, in each case and I want to say that I have no uh, make no sense of having these be equivalent points there simply happened to be three that came to my mind as I thought about this. The first is one that has already been uh, mentioned by Ambassador Zarif, and that is the question of the Iranian nuclear program. And I will try to state uh, in a few words what is the concern that the United States and the international community has with this program. As you know, the Iranian government is insisting on its right under the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which it is a signatory, uh, to develop nuclear energy uh, for peaceful purposes and has dispensed with the safeguards and inspections mandated uh, by the International Atomic Energy Commission uh, as it moves toward enrichment of, um, uh, uh, of nuclear material in order to be able to um, uh, I'm sorry, what I'm trying to say is enhanced uranium enrichment, 
in order to be able to produce such energy. And I have to say very frankly and uh, with sadness that in light of past dissembling by the Iranian government about the nature and purpose of its nuclear program, uh, these words are not, um, are not given credit by the International Atomic Energy Agency or the United Nations Security Council. And it is for that reason that the Security Council and the Atomic Energy Agency, uh, International Atomic A Agency, Agency, have demanded that Iran, as an earnest of its good intent, cease the enrichment of uh, uranium, uh, during which time a negotiation can be conducted for uh, uh, arriving at a general solution that would perhaps, hopefully, permit Iran to develop a peaceful nuclear program. I want to stress that Iran has the option to withdraw from the Non-Proliferation Treaty, as uh, other countries did not sign it, that became nuclear states. And, uh, but at the present time, it seems to me that Iran is, the, the burden of proof lies on the Iranian government to show that its nuclear intentions are peaceful. Secondly, and I realize this is a, this is a more controversial point, it certainly is for me, uh, there is a strong sense in the United States that Iran is fishing in troubled waters in Iraq. Uh, it is stated as a matter of certainty by the United States government that those actions which I described are taking place and that uh, the United States has no, uh, no recourse but to respond in the way that it is done. Uh, I want to stress that because of the nature of intelligence gathering, the United States has so far been unwilling to give concrete proof of its assertions, but this is stated as a matter of certainty by responsible uh, United Nations officials, including the under this morning the Under Secretary of State for political, uh, political Affairs, Nicholas Burns, who is a man that um, I met in 1979 when he arrived halfway through his graduate studies in uh, Nouakchott, Mauritania, where I at that time was assigned. And I think that was one of the occasions when Nicholas Burns was surprised at what his surroundings were going to be for the summer. And he rose to the occasion uh, magnificently. And uh, his brilliant career is a matter of envy to most of his colleagues. The third point that concerns me about um, about Iran's activities are the pronouncements of its president, uh, Mohammed Ahmadinejad, concerning the right of Israel to exist and his convening. And by his convening this, he gave official sanction to a conference aimed at determining whether a Holocaust, in which there is no question but that millions of Jews perished ever existed. There will probably be some parsing as to um, uh, what exactly Mr. Ahmadinejad had to say. I think I understood what he had to say. And I find his remarks abominable, first of all. And in the second place, I find them remarks that may have been rather cleverly calculated to uh, enrage a large body of American opinion, including the opinion of this um, former American functionary, and therefore, in our democratic system, to make it more difficult for the United States to engage in the kind of dialogue that Dr. Uh, that, uh, Dr. Zarif is, Ambassador Dr. Zarif, has, uh, has mentioned. So I, I must say I see a purpose of uh, using the way our democracy works and the importance that our public opinion has uh, to, in these pronouncements of, of uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad to make dialogue more difficult. So those are my three uh, problems that I have with, uh, with um, uh, Iranian policy that I think are helping to contribute to this problem. Um, with respect to the United States, 
I want to say very frankly that I think that the idea of labeling, putting Iran on the shortest of lists that we had of international bad actors, of lumping them, uh, the Iranian government and the, the, the state, in our axis of evil, along with North Korea and I Iraq, was a, an action I, I hope it was that its consequences were not calculated, but to treat a country with which we have had a long and very complicated relationship in the past, to use uh, diplomatic uh, mumbling, uh, is, was a certainty to uh, ma make the Iranian government decide that there is no need, there is no use in pursuing uh, dialogue, and as an Iranian official said in a, a slight mixing up of, uh, of um, English metaphor, uh, to let the balls roll. In other words, to get on with the business of confrontation. Secondly, I think that the detentions that uh, the, uh, this administration is engaged in of people involved in, um, in uh, uh, fighting uh, against uh, us in various places, alleged to have fought against us. The, um, the capturing of people alleged to have been, uh, to be uh, Al-Qaeda operatives and uh, then discovered not to have been Al-Qaeda operatives and their release, the, the, the grabbing of them from, from the streets of various European cities and having them rendered to countries where they would be tortured. Uh, and I want to emphasize the people held in Guantanamo, for the most part, as we know, are held without charge and with assertion that they, they need not be charged, uh, is something that has, again, to use diplomatic language, enormously complicated our own task uh, if, should, we seek, should we be serious about seeking dialogue with Iran. And uh, then uh, finally, I want to say, I think that the United States has been more zealous than others in the international community with whom we enjoy a very strong measure of agreement with respect to the Iranian nuclear program, which is the big substantive problem that, um, that we must deal with, uh, has been more zealous in attempting to, uh, to isolate Iran and making, uh, making a rapprochement uh, more difficult. So those are the, the, the difficulties that I see in the policies of the two sides. The next problem that I want to cite, and there is very little uh, other than problems to speak of here, is the danger of miscalculation by one side or the other and allowing us in the, in the, school guard, in the schoolyard parlance to uh, let our mouths get us into something that our feet can't get us out of. And the first one of these I want to say is that Iran, the Iranian government, could calculate that because of the difficulties that we have in Iraq, that we are not capable of lashing out against Iran and of doing uh, the, that, that country very, very grave damage. I think we might uh, be put in a situation, given a, the, the right sort of provocation, that we would do this even though we would uh, be concerned about what uh, might happen to our long-term interest in the region. In other words, we, like the Iranian of official, would be prepared to let the balls roll in a, uh, a certain situation that was too provocative to us. Um, so I think that's a miscalculation that the Iranian government could make, and I urge Ambassador Zarif uh, to um, do all he can to, um, that, that such a provocation does not occur. I think with respect to the United States, we are still in a situation in which we could, we could be um, uh, perhaps overconfident in our ability to achieve a military solution in the region that might involve Iran, and that we might, I'm going to say this very plainly, be overconfident in the intelligence that we are gathering about what Iranian activities may be in Iraq and elsewhere, notably in Lebanon, um, and that that also could lead to a, um, to a difficulty. Now, before I, make, before I close, I'd like to make one final 
analytical point. Uh, as I thought about this crisis, and particularly as my mind was focused when it was, uh, I discovered that I was to be um, the, uh, the discussant in this, uh, in this meeting, <coughs> rather than simply an unglorified moderator, which was my original role, um, I, I discovered, I think, that Americans and Iranians are in the process of uh, working their way through uh, a sort of political change. And that um, it's an interesting thing to think about. In both ways, we are in the process of making non-binding resolutions and presenting these resolutions to our governments. I think with the United States, very few words need to be said. Uh, the Senate next week is almost certainly going to present a resolution uh, disapproving in some way uh, President Bush's uh, determination to uh, send 21,500 more troops to Iraq. Uh, so that is going to be something that is non-binding. Now the Congress is very concerned that it not be binding for um, reasons, uh, dangers that uh, might that our troops might face were that to be the case, and also, very frankly, for political dangers that they would face if they were to uh, move too far in that direction. Now, Iran also has passed a kind of non-binding resolution in the past uh, two weeks in its municipal elections and elections to its, um, to its uh, Council of Experts. And I commend all of you here, you can still find it online, to read the piece in the Sunday Times Magazine by Laura Secor, S-E-C-O-R, and it comes right up if you just put that in the, in the appropriate place on the Times website, about the, this phenomenon. What has happened is I think that President Ahmadinejad, and forgive me, Ambassador Zeri, for saying this, I'm doing this as, as an analyst rather than as an, an advocate, uh, has lost an, an enormous amount of popularity. And I would like to think that in Iran, which is a country that for many years has uh, enjoyed, uh, I would say, a relationship with its Jewish community that is kept respectful. Uh, I will not say this is an equal relationship or that it is a, it is a, a good relationship, but it is one that is kept respectful by the innate uh, civilization of the Iranian people. I th I would, so I would like to hope that part of the repudiation of uh, President Ahmadinejad uh, in these elections stemmed from that kind of feeling. It also certainly stemmed from a, uh, a wish not to have a confrontation with the United States and from the fact that President Ahmadinejad, despite a lot of big talk, has not succeeded in delivering on his promises of economic prosperity. Um, so I think in a sense, our two peoples, uh, we by, by our new elected representatives in Congress, are sending uh, non-binding messages to our governments. The difference, of course, is that the, in the United States, uh, we will be given the opportunity to make that resolution binding or to repudiate that resolution when we vote in our elections in uh, two years hence. Uh, the Iranian government, too, will have elections three years hence for its president. But because of the bifurcated nature of the Iranian political system, there is a large part of the, um, of the, um, the Iranian political um, establishment that need not be bound by a resolution should it result, as I, I will say I uh, very much hope it does, in the uh, repudiation at the polls of President Ahmadinejad. Uh, what I hope is that should that happen, that the uh, part of the Iranian political establishment that need not be responsive to public opinion and that has not been responsive to public opinion in the way it, is, it has done its business with the Iranian people, uh, certainly over the course 
of the 1990s, and most particularly during the, the presidency of, um, of uh, Mr. Mohammed Khatami. Uh, I would hope very much that it would uh, listen and perhaps act wisely. I conclude simply by saying that uh, some sort of grand gesture, I believe, is needed in terms of uh, beginning a dialogue with Iran. And so I end by uh, echoing Ambassador Sarif's uh, much more eloquent statement of his wish for, that, um, for, that, for such a dialogue to, uh, to occur. I think that uh, our two governments owe it to our two peoples, and indeed to the rest of the world, to make that effort to talk to uh, your enemies, as President ba as uh, Secretary Baker and uh, former Congressman Hamilton said, Congressman Hamilton, uh, Secretary Baker is also formal, former, uh, that, uh, and in some way, transfer those people from being enemies to people with whom you gradually begin to build a relationship of respect and confidence. Thank you very much, and I'm, I don't know what happens next, but uh, Mr. Beligi will tell me, and I will do the best I can to follow his instructions. Thank you. Thank you. Time to get you involved. Uh, if you can begin to make your way to this one microphone here, we will do our best to get as many questions in and responses to those questions, comments and responses. I ask all of you, including uh, uh, Messrs. Zarif and Dunbar, to also keep your responses and your questions brief. I will tell you if you're not chilling out enough, and let's be our best here. Yes, sir. Mr. Ambassador, as you know, as you must know, Last year, a contest was held in your country to find the funniest cartoon about the Holocaust, an atrocity where millions of people were forced into gas chambers and then burned. In your opinion, which cartoon did the best job of making fun of this atrocity? Well, Holocaust was an atrocity. It was a genocide. And we have made it clear that genocide against any people, regardless of their religion, belief, or race, is abom abominable, must be condemned, and we should do everything in order to prevent its repetition. That is the position that we have taken in Iran in official government uh, policy uh, repeatedly. Now, there are differences of opinion on looking into historical facts. I know that it is, for victims of Holocaust, a very difficult uh, question to accept that others may want to look into how this historical uh, event happened, what was the magnitude, what happened after, how it has been used in order to justify violations of human rights of a people who did not have anything to do with that horrible crime. If we want to prevent genocide, we need not, we should not allow one genocide to be used to justify another huge violation of human rights, which has been taking place for over 60 years. You have seen people from the United States describing what's happening in Palestine, what's happening to the Palestinian people who had nothing to do with the crime against the Jewish people, as a system of apartheid being implemented in the occupied territories. Nothing could justify this. And I do not consider any cartoon to be uh, representing reality. You have seen cartoons in the West uh, which has enraged the Muslims in the Islamic world. You have seen the most sacred values of the Muslims being ridiculed in the West. 
and people have defended them as freedom of speech. I wonder whether you have taken the same position when, it, when the Danish newspaper uh, printed cartoons of our prophet and ridiculed him and showed him in unacceptable situations. So we cannot have double standards in dealing with freedom of speech. We cannot have double standards in dealing with genocide. We cannot have double standards in violations of human rights wherever they may occur. Violations of human rights against anybody, genocide against anybody is, must be rejected and we must do everything to prevent that from happening again. And I think it needs to be looked at in that perspective. Iran has the largest Jewish population in the Middle East. They live freely in Iran. They, they have representatives in Iranian parliament. And they live with their Iranian Muslim Christian compatriots. They have their views on various issues. They may have differences with the current government, but they are a respected minority. And there is no history of anti-Semitism in Iran, no history whatsoever. Anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is a Western concept. And it must be dealt with in the West, as is Islamophobia, and other unfortunate racial prejudices in the West. Thank you. Next question, please. Let, let me also say, it would be very useful if we not make comments or clap between each question so we can get as many people in as possible. Yes, sir. Good evening, Ambassador. My question is actually related to what you just said. Um, it is painfully apparent that, especially in the United States in general, that there are preconceived notions about Islam in the Middle East that are not wholly representative or accurate as to what they really are, especially among the common people of the Republic of Ir Iran. So my question to you is basically, what would you like to say to all of us here that convey the cultural, the religious, and the political aspirations of Iran, especially with the voice of the common people? And what can we do as common as um, college students at Boston University to help facilitate these views to sort of enlighten everybody as to what the Middle East is really like and, what, and how to end these preconceived notions. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for your understanding and that question. Uh, I, I hope that somebody will ask me a question about the nuclear issue because I left it out so that hoping that somebody would ask that question. So somebody asked that question, but let me, let me answer your, your, your comment first. Um, I believe the problem, and I have lived most of my adult life here in the US. I, I came here when I was hardly 17. And, and, and since then, I've been mostly living in the US or, or visiting. And I believe the problem here in the West, and it's not just the United States, probably the United States is least affected by this problem, is that the rest of the world is seen not as equal partners, but as objects. You, even if, if, you, if you look at Orientalism, in, in Oriental studies, you see the other side as an object of understanding. That is the best approach, not as partners in mutual understanding. That would lead to terminologies that are subhuman. For instance, in the liberal tra tradition here in the US, we talk about carrot and stick, because some people only talk about stick. I mean, if you, if you look at the current administration's policy, it's only imposing pressure on Iran, the other country, in order to bring them into line. Now, people who are questioning this tactic are saying, no, 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 this is not good enough. Use carrot and stick. Now, you know where the concept of carrot and stick comes from? The concept of carrot and stick comes from how you treat a donkey. You show a carrot to a donkey in order to entice it to follow, and if it doesn't follow, you use the stick. Now, you don't use these concepts in order to deal with a different people. I think it is important for all of us to understand that the other side, and I have a difficulty with, with the word the other side, but our Negotiating partners are also human societies. They have concerns, they have anxieties, they have aspirations. Iranians, just like Americans, have their families. 
want a better future for their children, want to live in a peaceful world, want to be able to communicate, to use the benefits of technology. Nobody can come and tell the Iranian people that this is not, you're not good enough for this. That nuclear technology is good for everybody, but not good enough for Iran. But, but Iran is not good enough. We cannot trust Iran. It is as if one side, one part, is the center of universe, and everybody else should accommodate uh, the views of this side. I think that is the major problem, preventing understanding and cooperation and leading to resentment in various Eastern and Middle Eastern societies. Next question, please. Hello, Ambassador. Um, Good evening to you. I don't have a question about nuclear technology at all. Um, I just wanted to know, <laughs> in terms of uh, Iran's uh, role in the Middle East, if uh, it's also competing with Syria in terms of having the most influential power um, in that region. No, we, we, don't, we don't see our role in the Middle East as being as competing with anybody. Iran is a reality in the Middle East. Iran is a reality more, more than in the Middle East in the Persian Gulf region. We are the largest country in the Persian Gulf. We have our concerns. We have our anxieties. But our prosperity, our well-being, our security requires a secure environment. We are dependent on the Persian Gulf for our, for our life livelihood because that's our only access to the rest of the world, open seas access to the rest of the world. That's where our, all of our oil is exported from. We want security and stability in this region. We're not competing with anybody. We believe that security in this region cannot be achieved through competition. We believe security in this region could only be achieved through collaboration and cooperation among the countries in the region who enjoy a lot of commonalities. And we believe at the end of the day, the United States also stands to benefit if it allows the countries in the region to have mutually respectful relationship among each other. In 1986, at the heart of Iran-Iraq war, Iran suggested a security and cooperation framework in the Persian Gulf region. And I believe if we had uh, and, and that uh, was later included in, in a Security Council resolution, if Security Council resolutions are that important. That was included in a Security Council resolution, a binding chapter, seven Security Council resolutions, but it was never implemented. I believe had that been implemented, we would not have had the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, which started this entire mess of uh, Iraq's uh, weapons of mass destruction, everything else that you've heard, and the recent fiasco in Iraq. So I believe what is important is a collaborative cooperative framework where everybody is included, where the interest of everybody is served, particularly in our immediate neighborhood, where we have the most interest. Next question. Good evening, Ambassador Zafir. Um, I have to ask, in a region of the world where anti-American sentiment is so dominant, um, your country seems to go the other way. Many polls, including some conducted and released by your own parliament, consistently show an overwhelming Iranian majority supporting friendly relations with the United States. Now, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to ask you, could you shed some light as to why, with the exceptions of the people of Israel and Turkey, your country's citizens are the most pro-American of the Middle East? Well, I don't think with, with the current policies that would last long. Uh, I, I believe the, the Iranian people have nothing against the American people. If, if you're referring to a poll that was taken uh, three, four years ago, while a lot of Iranians want dialogue and relations with, with the United States and believe that a reasonable, serious relation can exist between Iran and the United States, a lot of them believe that the United States, the current policies of the United States are not conducive to that dialogue. If you read the same poll, 80-some percent of the Iranians believe that the U.S. policies were not conducive to a dialogue. What we need in a dialogue is the readiness of both sides to listen, to examine their, their assumptions, to see, for instance, these, these allegations that are being made against Iran on the nuclear issue, on Iraq, on other issues, to see whether there is any truth in it. Now, people are telling you that they found serial numbers in, in Iraq, and that would uh, be considered by, by Nick Burns and others as solid evidence of Iranian involvement. Did they look whether these, there were um, American weapons in the hands of uh, insurgents, whether they were uh, weapons originated in other countries in the hands of insurgents, because Iran produces weapons and sells weapons in the open market. So the point is, 
Although Iranians believe that American people are good people, that Iran and the United States have areas of commonality of interest where we need to cooperate, at the same time they believe that the type of behavior from the United States is not conducive. One example that Ambassador Dunbar referred to was, was inclusion of Iran in the access of evil. If you, if you remember, access of evil came about two months after Iran played a very constructive role in ending the conflict in Afghanistan and establishing a government in Afghanistan. And that is how the United States rewarded Iran for cooperating and being helpful in an area which was of extreme importance to the United States, particularly after September 11th. Unfortunately, we were included in the access of evil as a reward for that. And that was not during this president, but it was during President Khatami. Next question, please. Good evening, Mr. Ambassador. You spoke Good evening at the, to you. At the beginning of your speech, you spoke very eloquently about the virtues of peaceful discourse and avoiding conflict through an open dialogue. Uh, in light of that, I wanted to read two quick uh, quotes from the president you serve and ask you a question about them. The first quote reads, the Zionist regime is a dried up and rotten tree which will be annihilated in one storm, April 2006. And the second quote is, the elimination of the Zionist regime will be smooth and simple, October 2005. Could you clarify to this audience specifically how and why your president intends to end the state of Israel? Well, in, in none of the statements by President of Iran, nor any other Iranian official, Iran has threatened Israel or any other country. We have said publicly and clearly that Iran will not threaten or use force against any other member of the United Nations. That has been clearly stated, including by the President and by others. Now, if you want to read statements, I will also read a statement by the Israeli Defense Minister, Mr. Shaul Mufaz, who said in December of 2004, even before President Ahmadinejad was a member of Pol uh, was, a, was the mayor of Tehran, let alone president of the Islamic Republic. He said that when Israel decides to attack Natanz, the, the nuclear facility, it will make sure that civilian casualties will be minimal. This is said in Farsi, on Farsi Israeli radio, because as you know, Shaul Mufaz is Farsi speaking because he was born in Iran. There were other statements. I can quote you statement after statement made not by the, rec the recently appointed Deputy Prime Minister of Israel, who has made all sorts of uh, statements threatening not only Iran, but every other country in the region, uh, but uh, by people like Shimon Peres. You know, Shimon Peres in, April, in March of 2006 said Iran can also be wiped out from the face of the earth. So let us look at facts. I say before you, that Iran has not threatened any other country, will not threaten any other country. And I want you to ask others, including Israel, the United States, or even Great Britain, if they can have an official representative of their countries making the same statement, that is, they will not use force against Iran. What you hear from them, as you heard this morning from Nick Burns, who tried to make it as uh, diplomatic as possible is that we, we do not remove any option from the table. This forgets the fact that according to the United Nations Charter, threat or use of force is not an option on the table. Now, I can tell you that those of you who study law, as I did, use of force and threat of use of force is a violation of the most basic principles of international law. Now, you consider the United States as a country of law based on the respect for the rule of law. And this country, at the level of its president, says we will not remove the option of the use of force against another sovereign nation from the table. I think it is important for people to look at realities. Iran is not threatening any other country. It's saying it clearly that it is not threatening any other country, and we expect others to say the same. Next question. Salam, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I want to thank you for coming today. Alaykum salam. I wanted to thank you for coming today and engaging in this dialogue. I live in Iran, and uh, 
unfortunately, I'm more comfortable asking these questions here. Hopefully, one day we, that can change. Um, I had a question. Mr. Ahmadinejad wrote an 18 letter page, 18 page letter to uh, President Bush last May. Um, I wanted to see what the purpose of that message was. Was it to start a dialogue between the two nations for the first time after 25 years? And also, uh, President Ahmadinejad criticized uh, President Bush on the issues of Guantanamo Bay uh, about unfair trials and such not. I was wondering, do we have fair trials in Iran regarding journalists or a religion such as Baha'i? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I, I, I think uh, the letters that were sent by, by President Ahmadinejad, both to President Bush and one to the American people, was a genuine attempt to engage in a serious dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, they were not reciprocated. And it, 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 it in, probably indicates that there's no desire for dialogue. We see in, in the policy that is being followed today in Iraq that there is a desire for exactly the opposite, and, and that is regrettable. Uh, as far as human rights are concerned, some people have considered themselves to be the champions of human rights. And it is for that reason that their behavior must be questioned and must be taken to account because they have designated themselves the champions of human rights. As for Iran, we have our difficulties. We are in the process of creating a culture of human rights. As somebody who has taught human rights in, in University of Tehran uh, for many years, I can tell you that a culture of respect for human rights is an important uh, and, in, and truly impressive development in Iran, where Iranian people are demanding their rights. We're not ha even halfway uh, in, in reaching that goal. But, but look at the realities in the region. It is one of the few countries in the region where every office is an elected office. And I, uh, of course, Ambassador Dunbar made it so difficult for me to, to object to anything that he said. But I, I, I can tell you that the Assembly of Experts, Ambassador Dunbar that, you, that Dunbar, that you referred to, is the body that elects the leader. And that is the only unelected office in Iran, according to your estimations. And the people who elect the leader are elected by the Assembly of Experts. The number of candidates that run in Iranian elections, although there is a vetting process, represent a wider spectrum of views than the number of candidates that have run in the last US presidential election, uh, in, in, particularly with regard to their views at the time of the election on the Iraq war. Uh, whereas in the time of our presidential election, there was a much wider uh, spectrum of views uh, being uh, presented to the people in the election. Now, the people voted for President Ahmadinejad. As a civil servant, I represent the Iranian government. I may or may not vote for this president, but it is the vote of the people, and that is what counts. So going back to human rights, Iran does not claim that it has a perfect record in human rights. I, I believe no, but no country can claim that it has a perfect record of human rights. But countries who have taken the, 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 the self sort of arrogated role of championship of human rights must be accountable for the actions that they have done. And I believe Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and what is happening in the CIA prisons in Europe uh, is certainly a bad testament to that. Next question, please. You talked about looking into historical accuracies regarding the Holocaust. And I'll grant you, pinpointing an exact number is very difficult. So I'll give you within two million people, plus or minus two million people, how many Jews and how many people do you think were killed in the Holocaust? Well, my, my friend, I'm not an expert on this issue. I believe a great number of people lost their lives and it was a genocide, and that genocide must be condemned, and you should not allow similar genocides to be repeated. Genocides are happening. Genocides happened in Bosnia. Genocides happened in Rwanda. There are genocides even happening in the 21st century. We must prevent all genocides. Nothing can justify one genocide or another. I, I, I'm, I'm not a historian. I cannot answer you. I mean, I take your figure, whatever figure that you say, but would that justify the violation of the rights of others? Genocide 
violations of human rights, uprooting of people, must be condemned wherever it occurs. Next question, please. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, if you read the recent book, Target Iran, by Scott Ritter, the former UN weapons inspector in Iraq, it makes it pretty clear that the United States and Israel, either independently or together, are going to attack Iran for the purpose of regime change. Um, and that, you know, nuclear weapons and other sorts of issues are just sort of a pretext. Given this, and given a lot of the questions you've heard tonight about your president's statements, why don't the, the Ayatollahs, the real leaders in Iran, try to rein his inflammatory statements in? Because, I mean, don't you feel that only gives more ammunition to these people who are beating the drums to war? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm grateful for your question and your analysis. I, I believe people are looking for excuses to, uh, con for, for confrontation. And that is a very serious problem, and we need to address that. Now, the reason that they're looking for excuses is that Iran has offered many solutions to the nuclear issue. Uh, if, if you do not want me to go over them, I have written about them in, in, in op-ed pieces in the New York Times, in Los Angeles Times, and if you, if you have a chance, just look me up on the internet and you can, you can read these various uh, offers that we made. We have made offers to, uh, and now I'm using your question to, to, to just put my two cents worth on the nuclear issue. We have made offers that would make it impossible for Iran to develop nuclear weapons. But people are not interested in solutions because, as you said, they're looking for excuses. But then again, Iran has elected a president, and that president is the, the representative of, of Iranian people. He makes remarks in reaction to remarks that have already been made. Now, as, I, as you pointed out, these remarks have been taken advantage of by others in order to follow a policy that was being followed even before this president came to office. Now, I came here. I was appointed by President Khatami. I came here during President Khatami. And these policies were, were being followed even at that time. And I believe this is just a pretext, as you pointed out, that is being used in order to advance a policy that is detrimental for everybody. Nobody is going to benefit from such a confrontation. Solutions are at hand, but people are not looking for solutions. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today, Mr. Ambassador. Um, my question is as follows. The Iranian government recently showed great courage in giving support to Hamas, the democratically elected leadership of the Palestinians. However, many in the U.S. view this group to be a terrorist organization, despite their declaration of, <coughs> uh, despite their declaration of a unilateral ceasefire some years ago. What is your view of this classification? Well, it's the easiest uh, approach is to call your adversaries terrorists and to label people with, 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 with terrorists uh, without looking at, at the realities on, on the ground. As you pointed out, what is important is that we apply the same yardstick. Now, in one country, we say that the elected representatives of the people must train. And in another country, the United States says that the elected representatives of the people must be so frustrated and the people must be so punished for electing them so that they would say, uh, wish that they had never elected these people, and these people would wish that they had never run for elections. This, this is a problem of applying double standards. Now, it is important to respect the, the will of the people in the Middle East and to deal with their representatives, and through dealing with their representatives, find a solution. And we hope that uh, the Palestinians can come up with a solution to their own internal problems. Good evening, Ambassador. I have a complicated question, so I'll try to be as concise as possible. Um, as former Ambassador Dunbar already pointed out, tensions between our countries are rising. We have the second of two aircraft carriers headed towards the coast of Iran. We are the U.S. government is financing extremist groups within Iran. We have special operations going on there. And Bush has lately approved the targeting killing of Iranian intelligence officials and officers in Iraq. Um, furthermore, 
this country's news media is starting to demonize Iran in very much the same way that we demonized Iraq before that war. Um, that coupled with leaked intelligence, for instance, Israel saying that if, and, and the IDF has not confirmed this, they actually denied it, but um, that if the US was not to support Israel and attack Iran, Iran, they would consider using low yield nuclear bunker busters against the Iranian nuclear facilities. So I guess my question is, if this worst case scenario does develop, if our countries go to war, what do you see as the regional repercussions besides the obvious horrendous loss of life? Well, I, I would rather not hypothesize on a situation that, as you pointed out, would be a total nightmare. We hope that rationality would prevail and people look at the possibilities for finding solutions rather than creating a new crisis. But as you pointed out, Iranians, although not looking for a crisis, will defend themselves. We have defended them, ourselves against a well-armed uh, Iraq, which was supported by everybody in the world. When we, when we fought an eight-year war with Iraq, a war of aggression that was launched against Iran, everybody was supporting the other side. Now, I'm not overestimating the, the capabilities of Iran or underestimating the capabilities of the, of the largest uh, military power in the world. But, but, but the point is that this largest military power in the world is in serious trouble in Iraq, and it is creating a major havoc in the region because of those troubles. One uh, dimension of this conflict which is not yet appreciated is the magnification of the Shia-Sunni divide in the region, which will have huge consequences. I believe th this is the most short-sighted U.S. policy that is being pursued in order to justify some sort of collaborative scheme with the Arab countries against Iran to magnify these differences between Shia and Sunnis, or at least to allow this magnification of these differences by some demagogues to take root in our region. The implications for our region would be great. Not just the war, the implications, the cultural implications of the magnifications of the Sunni-Shia divide in the region will hurt everybody from India to Pakistan to even Europe and the region uh, in the Middle East. So people need to look at this more carefully. People will need to examine the consequences, and I hope cooler heads and rationality will finally prevail and people will not risk another misadventure in our region. Next question. I want to thank Ambassador Jarif for coming, for speaking with us via television and telephone. Um, and I want to thank uh, Dean Elmore for helping put this event together and Ambassador Dunbar and Bilal um, for also for his efforts at uh, tsunami relief um, last year. I, I myself am of Armenian descent. He's of Turkish descent, but we seem to be able to come together to accomplish humanitarian aid. So I think this is, Start your this question. is a cause for hope. Um, my question is, <laughs> My question is, um, I wanted to say a word about what the atomic experience in the West has been. Um, Three Mile Island was an enormous disaster, as was Chernobyl, and the United States and the Soviet Union both found that the development of atomic energy was disastrous. We still have problems with it today, so even though it might be difficult to come to some kind of um, agreement among powers, it may be in the best interest of Iranians to do what is possible to develop alternative energy sources besides atomic energy as well as you know avoiding the development of weaponry with it regardless of what takes place in the rest of the world because it's it's only for the future of everyone that that take place another another concern that I have that I think I share with you ambassador is um, with regards to Iraq as you said um, in Iraq Iran is going to be there. They can't just, Iran cannot pack up and depart. So um, I think any unilateral steps that can be taken to secure the border area, and I, I realize that it's a very complicated situation over there, but anything that can be done on the ground would elevate the stability on the border. I think that's a welcome suggestion. A third. Make this your final one. Certainly. Um, 
A third concern is that um, I take Egypt and Jordan as examples that perhaps perhaps dialogue would be a more prudent course rather than um, rather than seeking to um, engage those who want conflict. I don't think that I don't think anything's to be gained by by engaging with Hezbollah at, at any level. Um, I think that diplomacy is the best course. Thank you very much. And for the sake of moving on, let's take those as comments and get to our next question. I thought I'd get a chance to talk about the nuclear issue finally. That's OK. Go ahead. Let's no, take no, another question. Ahead. Good evening, Ambassador. I know you've been excited to talk about new technologies in Iran. Unfortunately, my question has to do with those not of the nuclear nature. <laughs> okay. um, as westernization is occurring, the people of Iran, particularly the youth, are seeing new technologies, iPods, email. Do you see these westernization um, moves as a threat toward possible governmental policies or toward the religious values of your country, whose officially elected government is nevertheless an Islamic state? And do you see this kind of exposure uh, as possibly negative or undesirable in its effect on youth, in particular uh, with respect to women in your country? Not really. I, I think Iran has the largest number of weblogs in, in, in the Middle East. We have about 70,000 weblogs in, in Iran compared to 1,000 in, in, in countries with, with similar levels of, of uh, literacy like Egypt. So uh, I don't think anybody is, is seriously afraid of the Internet. Of course, there are policies, there are restrictions that one or the other government agency may impose on, on the Internet, and people have various views on them. As you know, there are concerns about uh, uh, obscenities, pornography, other misuses of the Internet, and, and I, I believe same concerns exist. Uh, in, in other parts of the world. Now, there are various ways of addressing those concerns, and there are various views about how, how to address those concerns. But I do not believe that the Internet is a threat against the fabric of, of Iranian society. I think it's a major development that the Iranians are, are taking advantage of. I saw a report on, on CNN yesterday that religious seminaries in Iran are taking great advantage of, of, of the Internet and are making use of, of, of these new technologies. So I think it's, it's, it's a great tool. And it can be used to the best advantage of, of uh, the younger generation, the older generation, other generations. And I think Iran is in the forefront in, in, in the region. Now, I, I agree with, with, with those of you who believe that there are restrictions, and those restrictions are counterproductive. But, but there are various views in Iran, and those various views, I mean, there are Iranian people who believe that there should be greater restrictions. Now, you need to sort of accommodate various views in Iran. And it is the role of the government to find a, a, some sort of an equilibrium uh, under these circumstances. I should just say we have a very limited amount of time, so we cannot take any more people in the line uh, just so we can get through these questions. Next question. Um, first, I would just like to say I think it is a grave error to consider the Iranian president the face of the Iranian people, just as it is to consider the American president the face of the American people. There are re reasonable individuals on both sides willing to cooperate. Um, and it has come to my attention that Iran has offered the United States incentives for allowing your cooperation in rebuilding Iraq. Could you elaborate on how you would like to see this relationship evolve and what you would like to see it produce, more specifically culturally and politically in Iraq? Thank you. Well, uh, I believe Iran has a national security interest in, sec in a secure Iraq. Iran also has a national security interest in a democratic Iraq, because a democratic Iraq would mean no repeat of the experience that we had with the former Iraqi dictator uh, of, of uh, a suppressive, repressive regime that finds excuses to invade its neighbors in order to quell the domestic concerns. So I, I agree with you that there are interests in preserving security and uh, stability of Iraq, and in, in restoring. I mean, there's not much stability to preserve in restoring uh, stability and, and some sort of semblance of, of tranquility in Iraq. Now, there are parts of what is, parts of what is happening in Iraq is caused by resentment to occupation. 
That, that is a phenomenon that could have been predicted from the past. Parts of it are, are the work of demagogues who are spreading hatred between various communities in Iraq, which has no place in Iraqi history and in the, in the way Iraqis live together, although the majority was mostly suppressed by the minority. So Iran has the capability to contribute to bringing about stability, to getting rid of the uh, elements of insecurity in Iraq, just like anybody else in the region uh, should and could contribute to, to this uh, final outcome. The problem is whether we're looking for excuses again. I, I must mention this. I've mentioned this several times. Whether we're looking for excuses to confront, to put the blame for the disastrous failure in Iraq on the shoulders of somebody else here in the United States, or whether the U.S. is looking for a way out of the current quagmire in Iraq. I believe if there is a genuine search for solutions in Iraq, then we need not be faced with the type of problems that we are facing right now in Iraq. Iran has offered to the Iraqi government its support. Actually, the people who were captured by the United States in Iraq were people who were there on the invitation of the Iraqi government offering cooperation to, to the Iraqi government. Now, the United States has issued this policy of kill and capture at the political level. And if you read the Washington Post article, it is imposing pressure on the military commanders on the ground to implement it. And just look this what type of accidents this pressure can bring about. It's time to put an end to this madness and find a way to deal with the problems of the Iraqi people, the fact that 100 Iraqis are being killed every day. And there are ways, because the United States is not in the region. The United States does not understand the intricacies involved in the Iraqi society. We can understand those intricacies. We have relations with the Iraqi people that go back hundreds of years. Other countries in the region have this type of relations. And for somebody from outside the region to simply say that these people are bad, you cannot deal with them, and we need to unite against them, this will not bring about an end to the crisis in Iraq. I can assure you that the current strategy of President Bush cannot do anything in Iraq but to exacerbate tension. I say that with a heavy heart, because anything that could bring stability to Iraq would be welcome for Iran. Next question, please. Uh, good evening, Ambassador. Thank you for being with us tonight. I have a very simple question that puzzles me ever since the Iranian nuclear issue uh, came into being. And this is, what is the difference, the hypothetical difference, between the Pakistani nuclear bomb and the Iranian nuclear bomb? Suppose that the Iranian existed. The difference is that Iran does not want a nuclear bomb. We do not see our security served by, by a nuclear bomb. With all due respect to our Pakistani and Indian friends, we do not believe that their security was augmented by acquisition of nuclear weapons. And that is why after the nuclear tech explosions by Pakistan and India, we went to the Conference on Disarmament and called for universalization of the NPT. We believe that the NPT serves our security interests. And that is why we have been adamant in supporting the NPT. Iran does not want a nuclear bomb, does not believe a nuclear bomb will increase its security. Just look at the nuclear calculus. If Iran wanted to create a semblance of nuclear deterrence, it will have to be able to have either first strike capability or second strike capability against its perceived enemies. That would be ridiculous to conceive of a situation when Iran could have a first or second strike capability against any of its possible nuclear adversaries. And that was what President Chirac said yesterday, and then he was uh, so politically forced uh, in, in, into retracting those comments. He, he simply said the reality, it would, be, it would be crazy for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. Iran wants nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. I understand the comment that was made by your friend that nuclear energy for peaceful purposes has its own drawbacks. But it is the most serious source of renewable energy, and Iran is investing a great deal in other sources of renewable energy. Iran believes that the NPT could be preserved by maintaining a balance between rights and obligations. And I didn't get a chance to describe how Iran implemented those obligations. I didn't get a chance to disagree with Ambassador Dunbar to say that the IAEA has never repudiated Iran's claims that its program has been peaceful. In fact, the IAEA has time and again 
repudiated American claims that Iran's program is military. But unfortunately, those elements of, of, of the IAEA conclusions never get to American papers. The fact is, the IAEA has said time and again that it has found no evidence of Iranian involvement in military activity. And that, they have said, after 2,200 days of inspection in Iran, more inspection in Iran that was done in any other country. So, I mean, whatever you want to believe about the past behavior of Iran in this field, every single site in Iran, which was alleged by the United States to, be, to have been involved in nuclear weapons, has been inspected by the IAEA. If you read uh, Mr. Seymour's article, uh, Seymour Hersh's article uh, in, in the New York a couple of months ago, it says that even CIA has implant, Im, Im, implanted detection devices around various Iranian facilities, and all of them have shown that there is no activity, no military nuclear activity in Iran. But some people want to scare you. Some people simply want to scare the American people and the rest of the world that Iran has a nuclear weapons program, and they're doing their best to create this scare tactic. It's just a scare tactic. But this scare tactic might result in unintended consequences, which will be harmful to everybody. Quick response, Professor. Did you want to respond? Did you want to respond? No, I, I have uh, little to say on the details of this, but I think what is absolutely clear is that the Iran, it is not just the United States. The, uh, and uh, with, with respect to Ambassador Zarif, uh, the, um, the whole international community simply does not trust Iran uh, on this subject. Uh, and no, no more does the IAEA. And Iran has removed the safeguards and the inspectors. You can say that things went on in the past, but the track record, and Ambassador Zarif mentioned that in passing, is not one that gives confidence. All Iran needs to do is make the, the, the earnest that I mentioned of suspending enrichment and joining in discussions that hopefully would lead to a solution of the nuclear uh, problem and perhaps to an overall improvement of Iran's relations with the rest of the international community. I've got okay, let me address oh, those hold questions, on, hold on, if I one may. Moment. Whoa, whoa, hold on. I got three people that we've got to get in here. All right, I I'll didn't... Give both, I, I, I will give both, of you, I'll give both of you an opportunity at the end for very brief remarks. No, I think, I think this question, is important next that question, I address next this question. question. Please, we need three more questions. Oh, you want to hear... Go ahead. <laughs> you see, Ambassador, you, you, you got... You got several points wrong. The IAEA inspectors are in Iran today. Iran is implementing the safeguards agreement. Iran has never withdrawn from the safeguard. If you don't believe me, go ask Dr. El Baradai. IAEA inspectors are in Iran today. Iran stopped implementing the additional protocol, and there are only 35 countries in the world who are implementing the additional protocol. Iran implemented additional protocols for a full two years, and that is when the IAEA got to go and visit all the sites that the U.S. was alleging that Iran was uh, making nuclear weapons. So don't confuse the facts. The IAEA is right now in Iran, and it is inspecting in Iran. It is not inspecting according to additional protocol, which is an additional protocol, as the name implies. Iran is implementing the safeguards agreement, and I refer you to the last report of the IAEA to the Security Council. Second, you equate the pressure that the United States puts on the Security Council to adopt a resolution. People next door to you at Harvard have done a study how the United States buys vote in the Security Council. I remember one country voting no against the resolution on Iraq, and former Secretary Baker said publicly that that, that was a very expensive vote that that country uh, had. But if you want to listen to the views of the international community, listen to what the non-aligned countries, 118 members of the international community, said in Havana last September, September of 2006, after the Security Council adopted the resolution. 118 countries represent two-thirds of the members of the United Nations. And they said nobody can interfere in the decision of Iran to implement its nuclear program. Now, you do not want to consider that a part of the international community and want a Security Council that has failed in the past several years to implement 
policies to implement even its own resolutions on the Arab-Israeli conflict. This Security Council represents the international community, and 118 heads of states of the, of, of the majority of people's world do not represent the international community. That uh, leaves the question. Now, you, you talked about suspension. Iran, in fact, had two years of voluntary suspension. I negotiated that during the time that I was the lead nuclear negotiator for Iran. We maintained two years of suspension in order to find the solution, as you pointed out. But during those two years, and go and read what the Europeans are saying now. The Europeans procrastinated, rejected every offer that Iran made because of what you rightly said, the overzealousness of the United States administration in preventing any reasonable solution to the nuclear issue. We even offered not only the regular inspections, but, but we offered that IAEA inspectors be in Iran 24 hours a day on these sites, be present. This has happened nowhere in the world. We offered that to the IAEA. We offered that. I offered that on March 23rd, 2005, in Paris, to the Europeans. The Europeans believed that that was a good offer. We offered to limit the number of centrifuges that we built. We offered even to bring U.S., U.K., France, everybody else into a consortium so that they will be present on the site. None of these offers have been accepted. As I said, if people are trying to prevent Iran from exercising its rights, then Iranians will not buy it. If you want to be assured that Iran will never produce nuclear weapons, then I will be with you, because I want to be assured that Iran will never produce nuclear weapons. And I believe a large number of members of Iranian uh, diplomatic circles, a large number of Iranian leadership, including the Supreme Leader, are with you in making sure that Iran will never produce nuclear weapons, because we all believe that nuclear weapons are detrimental to Iranian secu security. So let's work together to achieve this. And I believe it is achievable. Yes, no. I'm sorry. OK, we'll let, go to our next question. Good evening. Um, concerning the policy of inclusion suggested by you, Ambassador Zafir, and what Ambassador Dunbar suggested about miscalculations that the Iranian government might be heading towards that would cause the U.S. lashing out against Iran and its capacity to do so, how would you comment on the Iranian military and financial funding of Hezbollah and other institutions involved or enlisted as uh, terrorist organizations by the U.S.? Which kind of reality is Iran proving with its support to institutions not allied and, in fact, hostile to the U.S. in the Middle East. An example would be the war in Lebanon over the past summer, and some of the critics that discussed that the war supported the U.S., supported by the U.S. on one side, and I mean Israel, and by Iran on the other side, I mean Hezbollah. Um, do you think that, uh, do you think we are heading towards a policy of inclusion, as you said, or will the U.S. lash out Iran as Ambassador Dunbar said, don't you think such power, such power tests and examinations, such as the one happened in Lebanon over the summer, um, would lead to a bigger circle of war in, in the region? Thank you. Well, I, I, I appreciate your question. I'm, I'm certainly for a policy of inclusion. But let us, let us agree on, on some principles. Now, Hezbollah is a political party in Lebanon with representation in the Lebanese parliament elected by the people. Its leadership is considered to be the most uh, popular leadership in the entire Arab and Muslim world and in Lebanon. And, and that is why the United States wants to find one, one way or another a way of, of removing that leadership, unfortunately. Now, you, the United States comes and imposes a title on this organization. I ask you, other than Israel, what other country has considered Hezbollah a terrorist organization? You'll find none. But let me, let me tell you something. The United States considers an Iranian organization a terrorist organization, but it signed an agreement with that organization in Iraq. There are information that that organization is being used by United States military 
in order to carry out operations in Iran, a, an organization that was designated by the United States itself as a terrorist organization. Now, if we want to simply apply one yardstick, and that is the yardstick of U.S. interest and U.S. perceptions, and not even U.S. perceptions, the perceptions of a few in the administration to the entire range of international problems and ex expect everybody else in the world to simply comply, my friend, this will not happen. This will bring greater resentment. We need to address the difficulties. Fighting occupation, fighting uh, for, for your national independence is not considered terrorism by the majority of the world. Please do not equate the United States and Israel with the international community. The international community has its own views and has presented its views and has refused to accept the views of the United States. Now, the United States has the largest stick and probably the largest carrot. We're not the donkeys that those sticks and carrots will work with. Professor Denbar, did you want to... <laughs> did you want to respond? Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Ambassador. Um, alaikum salam. My question is regarding the role of Iran in the current situation in Iraq. Uh, according to IPS News, uh, on January 11, 2007, I quote, uh, U.S. Special Forces stormed the Iranian consulate in Erbil in northern Iraq, arresting five diplomats. The Bush administration has justified the raids on the grounds that evidence is collected on Iranian involvement in destabilizing Iraq. I would like first to hear your opinion about that. Um, I would also like to hear your opinion about better militia, which is supported by Iran, and the role they are playing in Iraq, especially after they have been accused of calling Iraqi Sunnis on a da daily basis. Thank you. Well, let me, let me start from the, with the second one. I, I believe the division between Iraqi Shias and Sunnis is the legacy of Zarqawi. You remember the CD that was found by Zarqawi trying to create this division between Shias and Sunnis. I believe that is the most dangerous uh, predicament that may fall on Iraq. And everybody, Iranian, Iraqi, American, everybody in the region must do their best to avoid that. And Iran is certainly calling for that legacy to die with Zarqawi and not to stay behind. And I hope the United States would not support those leaders in the region who are agitating this, who are supporting this, who have called, uh, uh, used the scare tactics of a of Shia crescent even before there were conflicts between Shias and Sunnis in Iraq. And I, I would refer you to go and read what, what happened and when it happened, when the Shia Crescent, when the term Shia Crescent was used as a scare tactic, and when sectarian violence between the Shias and Sunnis in Iraq started. It's a violence that must be condemned by whoever it is committed. It must stop. Now, as far as the U.S. attacks on, 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 on Iranian uh, officers in Iraq, the Iraqi government has rejected it. The Iraqi government has said that these people are here to establish liaison with the Iraqi government, with various parts of the Iraqi government, with the Kurdish government in Kurdistan. We have had a long presence in Iraq. We, you see, the irony is that the people who are currently in Iraqi government were once shunned by the United States and by the rest of the world because everybody was hurrying to support Saddam Hussein. Iran, on the other hand, always was friends with these people. And that is why we maintain good relations today with them, as we maintain good relations with them when they were in exile, either in Iran or, or elsewhere. And that is why we have maintained contacts and collaboration with them. And the Iraqi government has rejected U.S. accusations against Iran time and again. And I hope the United States will come to realize that these allegations, accusations, targeting, killing, capturing Iranians will not advance its agenda in Iraq it will further engulf it in this quagmire that it has created for itself in Iraq. I'm going to give you the final question. Pressure. Um, good evening, and thank you for coming. And I'm sorry for any disrespect you might have felt tonight. Um, I, was when, um, I didn't feel any disrespect. <laughs> I'm grateful to all of you for being as civil as expected uh, in these difficult circumstances. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
As stated before, you said, uh, stated that the Iranian government doesn't necessarily represent the people of Iran. As someone who is a diplomatic voice for both the people and the government, how much do you feel your diplomatic influence is compromised, if at all, by the divided points, points of view? Well, you see, nobody represents the views of all the people. The people have mechanisms of decision-making, mechanisms of reflecting their views. As Ambassador Dunbar said, there are interesting mechanisms where people can, in fact, repudiate policies, can support policies, can bring people into office, kick people out of office. And that's the beauty of participatory systems. I don't want to use the word democratic, because then that's a, that's a label that is conveniently used to, to support friends and to reject enemies. But, but in, in participatory systems where people have a, have a voice in, in, their, in their governance, uh, these, these mechanisms work. And Iran is not a, a unitary system, as the U.S. is not a unitary system. The various people, various voices, various views in every society, I respect that Americans have different views and, not, uh, and the president does not necessarily represent the views of everybody. But the point is that this president was elected by the American people. And when we deal with, with the U.S. government, unfortunately, we have to accept him as representing the United States, I'm, I'm not, not, not any disrespect intended here. And, and, and the, the same is true for other governments. We deal with, with societies, with their governments. But at the same time, it is important to allow people-to-people -people contacts, to allow American people and Iranian people see each other, to see that they are both rational people, both have similar objectives, want to have a better life for their children, and I hope, as governments, we can serve them achieve those objectives. Perfect. Professor Dunbar, I'll give you one final comment. All right, well, I, I thank the ambassador for a very eloquent presentation of um, uh, the Iranian uh, role in the world. I wish that I could be as sanguine as he is about Iran's intentions with respect to, to nuclear weapons and simply point out that the, that the Security Council, and uh, which he discredits, and the United States for <clears throat> allegedly buying votes in the Security Council, the, incidentally, the point that he, he referred to <clears throat> is accurate. This was when, um, <clears throat> when um, uh, a certain country to which I happen to be ambassador um, <laughs> made the um, uh, made a vote against the decision to expel uh, Saddam Hussein's armies from Kuwait. Uh, it was not made by the Secretary of State, but it was made by one of his lieutenants. Um, uh, uh, the it is the Iran has simply not uh, been credible on the nuclear uh, question with not just the United States, but with the, with the Security Council. I hope that a way is found that Iran is able to, to prove its, its credibility. Uh, mentioned Hezbollah, there is no question uh, that Hezbollah made itself a very imp uh, popular force this summer uh, by its um, uh, fighting its war, which it began uh, against Israel by taking the, the Israeli troops hostage. Um, I think that it's, my, my understanding is that its popularity inside, uh, inside Lebanon is somewhat less than it is perhaps in the, in the rest of the, of the world. I hope, frankly, that a, a way can be found to accommodate Hezbollah's undoubted stature in the, uh, in the Lebanese uh, political process. As far as Hezbollah being on the terrorism list in, is concerned, uh, the United States and Hezbollah go back uh, some distance, and um, <clears throat> there have certainly been actions uh, ag directed against uh, Americans, and particularly American military personnel, that have caused um, that uh, deep animosity and the, uh, the inclusion of Hezbollah on the on the terrorism list. Uh, so I, I end by simply saying that I hope this, uh, this mistrust, which is certainly very high on this side of the, uh, the Atlantic, can be dispelled. And um, 
that cooler heads can prevail. Um, I guess a final point um, about the um, about the the Iranian government and the bifurcated nature of the state, and you're making the point that uh, only one person is elected, I submit to you that that side of the Iranian state that I mentioned is uh, able to be sure that it gets done what it wants to have done most of the time. Uh, I am not uh, here to, uh, to tell uh, Iranians what sort of a, a regime they need to have. But I think that the Iranian people tried to speak in the 1990s and early, uh, early part of this century as to what sort of a regime they wanted to have, and they were unable to do so. I hope they will speak again and that they will help uh, with the goodwill of people like Ambassador Zarif to create a, um, uh, a regime in Iran that is more respectful of the rights of its citizens. But I, I end with the, uh, in, in agreeing and joining Ambassador Sarif in the hopes for better times ahead and that the crisis that we face at the moment can be dispelled. Thank you. Impressive. I'm very proud of everybody here tonight. Uh, we were going to, uh, well, we'll keep the room here if people want to just stick around and chit chat with each other. Uh, tomorrow, I often do a coffee and conversation group on Fridays from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, I'll, I'll use that time tomorrow to see if we can talk a little bit about the nature of programs like this and further this discussion if you will join us, 3 to 5 p.m. in the Howard Thurman Center tomorrow. To close this out, I'm going to have Bilal come on up here and give us final words. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Zarif, first of all, because when we invited him, uh, within 10 hours, he emailed us back with saying yes, first of all. Thank you, Ambassador Zarif. <laughs> Second of all, I would like to thank uh, comment our commentator, Ambassador Dunbar, who was so enthusiastic about uh, this program. Thank you, Ambassador Dunbar. I would like to thank all of the Boston University departments, uh, Provost Campbell, Dean Almore, making this uh, program uh, into a success. And I invite everybody to join uh, in International Students Consortium so that we can work together to make greater and better projects. Thank you very much. Let me also thank all of you for a very interesting discussion. I apologize if I was harsh, certainly to Ambassador Dunbar and to all of you uh, at any time during our conversation. No disrespect was meant. And I appreciate the civility with which you conducted this, this discussion. I hope to be able to, to see you all in person rather than this electronic means of communication. But I wish you the best and have a good evening. <laughs>